Assalamu alaikum everybody. Uh, today we will be doing the practical uh, on alginate beads. It's on page number 39 of your practical booklet. Question number one. The year is May, June 2010, paper 3-2. So this practical begins with uh, the background information that uh, you know that the yeast is a unicellular fungus and the yeast cells, they contain enzymes which catalyze the breakdown of glucose to produce carbon dioxide and water. You know from your O-level knowledge that the yeast cells can respire aerobically and they can also respire anaerobically depending upon whether or not oxygen is present. So the yeast cells themselves have enzymes which can catalyze the breakdown of glucose to produce carbon dioxide and water. Now, as soon as carbon dioxide is, uh, and water are produced, carbon dioxide reacts with water and forms a weak acid. Bromothymol blue is a pH indicator which changes color as shown over here. So this means as the pH decreases, the color will change from blue to green to yellow. So in case the pH is six, the color will turn yellow. So the change in the color of this indicator will give us an idea as to how much carbon dioxide is produced, which means as to how, how far the reaction, this reaction has been successful. So how are, you, how are you going to do it actually? That if you remember that you have done the concept of immobilization of enzymes. So, so today you will be actually making alginate beads yourself. So this is a good opportunity for you to practice this because if such kind of a question comes in exams in your CIEs or maybe in your mocks, then uh, you should already know how to make them, right? Um, so you are actually uh, supposed to immobilize the yeast cells in sodium alginate beads and to follow a certain procedure to do what? You are actually investigating the independent variable which is changing the surface area of the beads on the reaction that is happening. Now the reaction which is happening is that yeast is, yeast contains an enzyme which is going to catalyze the breakdown of glucose to carbon dioxide and water. You are going to keep a check on this reaction by checking the color of the indicator, which will change color if the pH decreases, which means if carbon dioxide is being produced. And then at the same time, you're also changing the independent variable, which is the surface area of the beads to see what is the effect of changing of this variable on the rate of the reaction. These are the chemicals that have been provided to you. You've been provided yeast suspension, which is labeled Y, You've been provided sodium alginate solution labeled S. This you are going to use to make beads. You will also be using 1.5% uh, calcium chloride solution labeled C. And yes, of course, we have glucose solution. We've got the indicator B, and then we have sodium hydroxide solution, which is labeled A, as it's an alkali. So you have been given, all of you have been given a large test tube, okay? A large test tube. And what will you do? You will put 20 cm cube of C. C means the calcium chloride solution. So you'll be putting 20 cm cube of C or calcium chloride into the large test tube. Once you've done that, you will be using, you've been also given a small beaker or a container like this. Okay, it's a small container. And into that container, you are going to put five centimeter cube of S, right? So into the large beaker, you will be keeping 20 cm cube of C and into the small beaker, you will be putting five cm cube of S. S is the sodium alginate solution, this one. And, in the, and then after this, what will you do is that you will collect five centimeter cube of Y from below the froth and put it into the same container as S, meaning that you've been provided with the yeast suspension and whenever we make yeast, as yeast, yeast respires anaerobically, it produces lots of carbon dioxide. So you are going to collect Y from below the froth. From below the froth means that, for example, you've been given a test tube that contains yeast, right? So since there'll be, this is all yeast, okay? And since there's a lot of froth at the top, so you will not collect Y at the top. You will collect it from below the froth, which means you will be putting your syringe deep down and you'll be collecting five cm cube of Y. And after collecting that, you're going to put it into the same container as S. So this means now this container will be containing five cm cube of S 
plus it will contain 5 cm cube of y. Okay. Having done this, then you move on to act the difficult part of the question is to how to make the beads. What are you going to do? You're going to suspend the five centimeter syringe over the large test tube containing C, right? The five centimeter syringe over the large test tube containing C as shown in figure 1.1. Then this five centimeter syringe barrel is resting on top of the large test tube like this as it is shown in the diagram over here, okay? And then you're going to gently press down with the thumb, okay, very gently. You're going to press down with the thumb and what are you actually pressing down? You're pressing down the mixture of S and Y which you just made in the small beaker, okay? And as you press it down, it should fall onto the solution which is calcium chloride, right? The C that you had collected in over here. You had collected C over here, okay? And then what are you doing? You are making a mixture of Y, five centimeter cube of Y and five centimeter cube of S. And you will be uh, pushing down this mixture in the form of small, small droplets onto 20 centimeter cube of C. The same thing has been shown over here. See, suspend the five centimeter syringe over the large test tube containing C as shown in figure 1.1. And then you're going to drop it gently, right? This is how you're going to do it. Gently press down the uh, press down on the plunger of the syringe with your thumb to release a drop of solution C. Sorry, to release a drop into the solution C. This is the solution C. The drop should form a bead. Repeat step six, which is this step, to make the number of beads that you think you will need. You can decide how many beads you need. Of course, you should always make more so that in the end, if you require, like your beads have been wasted, so you always have a surplus supply. Dip the contents of the large test tube into the Petri dish. For example, you're making beads over here. So after you're done with making, let's say if I decide on a number that I'm making 20 or 30 beads. So I'm going to tip the contents of this large test tube into a Petri dish. <coughs> You've been provided with a Petri dish like this. So you're going to, you know, put all the beads into this Petri dish okay, or a shallow container so that you can easily, uh, you know, uh, remove these beads for doing the practical. Okay, and then now the next step is that you have to calculate the mean surface area of the beads. Mean sh shows you that, of course, you will find out the surface area of the beads of, uh, of quite a few beads. Let's say if I, like a reasonable number is, the minimum reasonable number is five. Let's say I've selected five beads and I'm going to measure their uh, diameter, right? And after diameter, of course, I can calculate the area and from area, I can calculate the surface area. And you all know that the formula for calculating the surface area of a sphere is four pi r squared, right? So you will first find out the diameter and then the radius. And then by applying the formula four pi r squared, you will calculate the uh, mean surface area, right? So let me just write down the, uh, formula for the surface area of the beads will be 4 pi r square, right? And you will take uh, roughly, let's say, 5 beads, okay? You're taking 5 beads and you are finding out their radius, okay? And uh, in order to find out the radius, you have been given a 2 millimeter into 2 millimeter grid to measure each bead. This two millimeter into two millimeter grid is a small piece of graph paper that has been a tiny piece of graph paper that has been provided to you. So it is two millimeter into two millimeter grid. You will be putting your bead right over here. It depends what, what is the size of your bead. Let's say if your <coughs> the bead is this much big or this much big. So you will be keeping it onto this grid, find out the diameter and then the radius and then finally find out the surface area but of course you'll be doing it for five beads because you need the uh, mean of this so um, let me just give you a value just a random value so that you can have an idea how you're going to do it Or I'll just share like this, for example, 
um, you will be using five or more beads. It's up to you. This, I'm just giving you the steps, okay? You will measure the diameter in millimeters. You will add all the surface areas. After the diameter, you will of course calculate the radius and then you'll find out the surface area by this formula. And then you will add up all the surface areas, which in this case, if I'm taking five beads, it will be all the surface areas of the five beads. Divide it by the total number of beads, the, the number of beads that you've selected, in this case, which is five. And then your answer sh should be, your final answer should not be exceeding to more than three significant figures. More than three significant figures, right? So this is how you are going to show all your steps because the instructions say that you're supposed to show all the steps in your calculation of the mean, right? Yes, you're going to show all your steps in the calculation of the mean. And then finally, you can see that whatever you get the value, you are going to write it down over here. And your uh, this will be the mean surface area of the bead will be millimeter square. And you can see five marks for this. So this means every step has been awarded a mark, right? Okay, after doing this, then you move on to this part. A student suggested that it was possible to investigate the independent variable, which is the surface area of the beads by changing the number of the beads. Yes, we can do that also. We can investigate the effect of changing the independent variable, which is the surface area, but just changing the number of the beads, right? Because when you change the number of the beads, the total surface area of the beads becomes different. So the maximum number of beads in this case, the student suggested, which he used was 20. Decide the other numbers, numbers of the beads to use and state the different number of beads you will use. So let's use some even range of numbers. For example, if the first random number of beads, maximum number that the student selected was 20, so we can roughly say, okay, the other three numbers of the beads which we will use will be, let's say 12, 10, and eight beads, right? Then you will carry out the student's procedure, which is label as many test tubes as you will need with the number of the beads for each test tube. Okay, so let's say uh, the first test tube is 20. And then um, the second test tube will contain 12 beads and 10 beads and eight beads. So this means in this case, I'm needing four test tubes and you will label them. Put 10 centimeter cube of solution G into each, each test tube. Let's say if I have Lab, uh, taken four test tubes, right? And into each of these, in this one, I'm putting 20 beads. In this one, I am putting 12 and 10 and eight, right? And then into each, what am I doing? I'm putting 10 centimeter cube of G. So I'm putting 10 centimeter cube of G. G is glucose into all of these, right? And then I'm putting one centimeter of B into every t uh, uh, test tube. B is the indicator. So I'm putting B also into all. And then if the contents of the test tube are not blue, then I will drop, uh, I will add a drop of uh, A, which is the alkali, to the contents of each test tube to turn them all the blue color, like uh, turn them all the same blue color. So <clears throat> even after mixing, or putting 10 centimeter cube of solution G into each test tube and one centimeter cube of B into each test tube, if the color doesn't change to blue, then I will add some A, a drops of alkali to make it uniformly blue. Now, after this, you will put the required number of beads into each test tube. Up till now, you haven't put it. Sorry, maybe I, in the mistake, by mistake, I have said that you are going to put the beads. 
you will be first mixing G and B into each of these test tubes. You, you just label these as test tube containing 20 beads, 10 beads, 10, uh, 12 beads, and 8 beads. And now you will, after mixing G and B, after putting the required uh, volumes of G and B into each test tube and making sure that the color of all the test tubes is uniformly blue, then you will put the required number of beads into each test tube. Put the bunk, okay? The bunk has been provided to you. Okay, let's say this is the bunk. You will put the bunk, right? And then you will mix the contents, mix every two minutes for six minutes. Put the bunk in each test tube, mix the contents, mix every two minutes for six minutes, right? Record your observations after each two minutes up to six minutes. So you're mixing every two minutes for six minutes, right? And then after each two minutes, you are going to record whatever you see, which is record your observations. You will record your observations after each two minutes and you will keep doing that up to six minutes. And then you are going to prepare your space to record your observations. Look at the marks. The marks are seven over here. So your table, you will make a table and you will record your observations, I think. Uh, I should not spoon feed you. I'm leaving it up to you as to what will be the uh, the headings of your table. How many columns are you going to make? You'll do it yourself. Because if I tell you each and every answer, you will never learn, right? So I'm leaving this to you. And in the end, if you have a problem, you can ask me. And then moving on to the student realize that there are two independent variables in this procedure. So state two independent variables. One, of course, is the surface area of the bead. And the other can be The, since it's a reaction, so it can be any independent variable. It can be the enzyme concentration inside the yeast also, right? So any one of these, it's one mark. So any of these is the correct answer. Suggest so how you would make three improvements to the student's procedure. Over here, yes, we can, uh, you know, be, uh, we should make sure that we, when we are shaking the test tubes, it should be equal magnitude of shaking all the time. Uh, we can repeat this procedure also because we haven't repeated it and we can find out the mean. We can use in order to see, we are only using uh, this bromothymol indicator to show us the uh, change in the pH. So maybe we can use a pH paper so that we can be more, uh, we can be uh, more accurate about uh, what is the change in the pH. Um, at the same time, since it's a reaction going on, so we can uh, you know, carry out this reaction in a thermostatically controlled water bath because since it's an enzyme catalyzed reaction, so it must be having, a, having an optimum pH. So, so we can carry out this reaction in a thermostatically controlled water bath so that the temperature is the same, so that this variable is maintained at a constant level. Yes, we can also use more beads or uh, we can use uh, more surface area. So these you can choose any one of these as an improvement to the student's procedure. Now is the theory part, right? And it's a very easy question in which uh, you can see in the diagram that the student is setting up the apparatus shown in figure 1.2 as another way to measure the carbon dioxide produced by the immobilized yeast cells over a period of <clears throat> 75 minutes. The student measured the distance the liquid moved in the capillary tubing. Of course, if you are going to use such a setup, right? You have yeast over here. The yeast will respire. It will produce CO2. CO2 will go, right? And it's going to cause the movement of this colored droplet in this direction. So this means the more the CO2 produced, the more will be the movement from this end to this end. So, and he's then doing it. He's measuring this, the rate of movement of this droplet over a period of 75 minutes. And this is the data that he got. You can see, that this table shows you the time from zero to 20, uh, 75 minutes and the distance that is moved by the liquid in the capillary tubes in millimeters. So you can see that as the time is increasing from zero to 15 to 30 minutes, the distance moved is also increasing. And then after 60 minutes, you can see that uh, the distance that is moved is the same. At 60 minutes also, it's 19 uh, millimeters and at 75 minutes also is 19 millimeters. So uh, the, you have to give a very logical explanation, description also. When you're asked to describe and explain the results, 
this means for description you will be quoting data right you quote data and for explanation you will write down the reasons why you are getting such a result why did for example in this table if i look at the table from here to here i can say that the level is increasing from here to here the level is decreasing right so you have to give a reason why this is happening over here so maybe you've given reason one then again you have to give another reason why is the level not increasing after 60 minutes and then at the same time you can also give a reason too as to why was there very little change between 45 to 60 minutes so keeping all that in mind and this question is for three marks so you will be giving um, relevant reasons for that and yes uh, you all know that whenever a reaction takes place between an enzyme and a substrate it depends upon the rate uh, of the collision of the enzyme substrate, the rate at which the enzyme substrate complexes are formed. And yes, you all know that any reaction cannot continue indefinitely because as the substrate is being used up and the enzyme is being used up, the reaction will eventually slow down. We don't have an indefinite concentration of substrate or an indefinite concentration of enzyme. Plus, since it's yeast, you have to keep this in mind. So the yeast might respire anaerobically, right? If uh, there is a lack of oxygen in the uh, apparatus, in that case, it will produce large amounts of ethanol. Ethanol is toxic to the yeast cells and which is why uh, they can be killed by it, right? Yeast cells can be destroyed by ethanol. Secondly, as the yeast cells are producing lots of carbon dioxide also, and uh, the carbon dioxide can dilute or it can dissolve in water and that will also affect uh, the uh, rate at which the pH is changed, right? And the rate at which the um, liquid is moving from the left to the right in the capillary tube. So this means that you can say that initially the carbon dioxide is being produced, but after a certain time, it stops increasing because, uh, the, um, because of various reasons, right? Because uh, the, um, the substrate was finished, or uh, you can say because there was a lack of glucose or substrate. And at the same time, maybe there was a buildup of ethanol, which is toxic to the yeast cells. There was lack of oxygen, right? And the carbon dioxide dissolves. Carbon dioxide can dissolve into glucose. It can dissolve in water, which is why, um, you know, the droplet was not moving and the movement decreased with time. So again, I'm, not, I'm just giving you some ideas. You will write down the answer yourself, right? After you are done with writing all these answers, completing your practical and your theory part, I have also shared the marks scheme in this document. You can refer to it, but please don't copy your answers from the mark scheme. You check your answers. The mark scheme has been provided to you so that you check your answers and be sure of whatever you've written is correct or not. So uh, thank you for listening. And I hope that was helpful.